Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. Just musically speaking, I just don't think robots can ever really do what humans can do in terms of what they bring to the table from their human experience. And and I may be wrong, you know, I may, there may very well be some extremely hyper intelligent robot that they're working on that we will not be able to decipher, you know, um, from a real human being at some point, but I think we're a really long way away from that. And the current AI tools we have today, I just don't think you're going to get the same level of context that a, a real human being can bring to the table. So like I said, nuanced, it's nuanced. And I think there's, there's good and bad and, and everything in between. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be something that kind of shows its true colors over time. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I get asked this a lot in terms of voiceover. You know, aren't you afraid that they're going to replace you with synthesized voices? Right. Well, I have the same the same thoughts that you do on music being replaced. Yeah. You know, it, there's a genuine human connection with what you're speaking. Mm-hmm. And sound is what makes us emotionally connect with each other. Right. So if you're if you're using a, a, a robot to do that or a, an artificial intelligence that doesn't really understand the natural human condition, right. it's really hard to get that emotional context through. Yep. You know, you can do it in things that don't take very much time, right. maybe, but anything that needs acting, right. anything that needs emotion, yeah. you know, the which context, I think yeah. music definitely needs yeah yeah and i mean and i've had this discussion with a lot of people especially on this podcast that if you're going to spend thousands of dollars on your video or your film or anything like that don't cheap out on the sound right (laughs) right like you're just gonna ruin and and make completely useless absolutely the thousands of dollars you spent yeah. on your film and video yep. like why would you do that yeah totally yeah i think people take it for granted absolutely that's, that's part of yeah yeah you probably get that a lot too i'll bet yeah oh yeah oh, i can press a button and make a song for a, a commercial you right know? well okay well let's also <laughs> see quality. how well it lands exactly <laughs> it, it's also quality over quantity sometimes yeah. you know you can have a hundred really really not so great tracks and you have a hundred of them sure but Mm -hmm. they may not have the same value as one piece of really high quality content so you got to do the math sometimes i totally agree Yeah. yeah audio branding companies do that all the time too they they do compose music mm-hmm. yeah. that companies use for their branding purposes oh, specifically yeah. to make it unified across all of their touch points and that's super important for them because yeah. they need to be consistent they need to actually reach the people that are experiencing their brand you absolutely know? You, can't, you can't do that with uh well I, I don't know like you i'm kind of like there could very well be in the future some time when an AI will be completely, um, you know, we won't be able to tell the difference at all. Yeah. But uh, but like you, I, I'm thinking that's a little ways off. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. And by then, I less mean, than we think. Probably, less than yeah. We think. <laughs> but I think by then, you know, we'll have had time to overcorrect and then balance out mm-hmm. and then make space for that. You know, it's kind of the same reaction people had to self checkouts in grocery stores and Easy Pass. Yes. It's like you always think it's going to ruin the world, and then you figure yeah. out, okay, actually, there are still, you know, a significant portion of the population that refuses to use Easy Pass. First of yes. all. And that's, I get it, you know, for some people, it's really like 
a thing, you know? Um, and the same thing with the, you know, the self checkouts. It's like, it's imperfect. I actually, it's so frustrating to go like half the time the things don't work and then you have to call the attendant over anyway. It's like, what's the point yeah. of this? I could have been through <laughs> the regular line like three times already. So <laughs> like anything, it's just, yeah. it balances itself out. We get used to it, though. Like, I know when I'm traveling in the U.S., I'm I'm north of Toronto. So mm. when I'm traveling in the U.S., it it's really annoys me when I'm in a restaurant and they take my card. Mm. Like, in, in most of the places that I go to here, they bring you a machine. Oh, interesting. And you can, yeah. you can put your card, you can just touch your card to right. the thing. And it yeah. takes... You know, it's like a debit machine mm -hmm. and it's there and they bring it to your table. Yeah. So no one has your card but you. Yep. <laughs> and it, I just find it super frustrating to go places where that isn't a thing yet. <laughs> yeah, it's actually not as common, I would yeah. say. Most places still do the whole take your card, bring it to the... I think that's because probably the cost of upgrading to that system is so much that most restaurant owners probably are like... Uh, forget it you know it might be but, and and yeah. the cost of uh actually explaining it to the people who work there you right. know like the them training. learning how to use yeah. it yeah so i mean i get it there's always this push and pull you know yeah. the technology is there but they you know some people don't want to use it because right. it's a pain <laughs> yeah and then there are the people who are still cash only so <laughs> yes <laughs> there's always yes. going to be the the faction that refuses to <laughs> to fold. do any of it <laughs> exactly. yes yeah but those are the people who still have all their life savings in their mattress it, right i mean you know like exactly. <laughs> that's a little <laughs> yeah that's a little beyond <laughs> yeah yeah, it could get a little strange. But yeah, technology is changing so fast. Yeah, for so, sure. Yeah. So what made you want to teach others how to do this, the mm. the syncing? And, and do you think that that's a really good way for musicians to make a living these days? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I... Um, so I'm not on the social apps anymore. I was for the majority of you know, my life, but recently within the last year or so for my mental health, I deleted everything and I would only check things really for DMs and once in a while. I totally get it. Yeah. But when I was on there, I was witnessing and participating in the sheer amount of effort that musicians are putting in to, you know, building these social followings just to try to convert them into streaming numbers right and uh, streaming as I'm sure you're well aware pays extremely little and requires a massive volume in order to be profitable and Spotify just came out and said content is free like um, right right excuse me exactly <laughs> you're right because they're not they're not really valuing the the time right they are not no. um so, you know, there's a lot to be said about that in terms of supply and demand, but just from a sheer, um, you know, economic or business principle perspective, it's like seeing, it's like, tr it's like watching someone, you know, try to empty the ocean by scooping, you know, cupfuls of water out. It's just not a great return on your investment. And so... I just, it's painful for me to watch that. It was painful to participate in it. I did it maybe for about a year and I was like, I'm not doing this. I can, this time I'm spending making content for people who don't really want it. I could be spending making songs that can go on, on commercials and make me money twice. So I was like, I'm good. <laughs> I tried it. I'm done. And so, um, yeah, I just want to be that beacon of hope and that other opportunity for people who see the light and are like, okay, there has to be a better way. And, and so hopefully I can teach them that better way. And hopefully they can start actually seeing a return on their investment. What do musicians need to know to get into sync? Yeah, I mean, I think they need to understand that um, it's accessible. It's more accessible than ever. First of all, the with the technology that's available today, like we're talking about, um, and even, but even just on a very simple level, um, it's extremely affordable to create your own music 
at a very, very high quality level. As long as you have a very simple setup, you know, a digital audio workstation, and maybe take a few courses in audio and editing and production and uh, maybe mixing here and there, right? Um, you can basically be a one-stop shop, which is extremely empowering. Uh, I had to teach myself to produce music uh, when I you know, was graduating college. I didn't really consider myself a music producer, so I studied it and learned it. Now, seven years later, I you know, I feel very comfortable doing that. Um, it doesn't have to take you seven years, but, um, essentially what musicians really need to understand is that the power to find success in sync is extremely accessible. Uh, and it's, it's right there in front of them, uh, as long as they're willing to go and, and get it. There is no, uh, there's no gate right? There's no gatekeeper. There's nothing that you have to do or have, or there's no one you have to know. Um, it's really just about, um, being willing and, and being willing to learn the ropes and, and do the work. And, um, and that I find, like I said, that to be extremely empowering. And, and for those who are willing to do that, it's really exciting because then you actually feel like the, your career is yours. That's a big deal, especially yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's hard. Yeah. So is there a type of musician that really does well in sync licensing? Well, you know, one of the, one of the many things I love about sync is that it's really, uh, there's room for everyone. I mean, of course, there's going to be more opportunity in a lot of the middle of the road type of music that's more in demand. You know, I'm talking about pop, rock, you know, this sort of very boilerplate type of music. But if you think about it, you know, there's a such a wide array of productions in terms of TV shows and movies and, you know, things are set in every decade, every century, in every country, you know, so the, the, the variety of music that's needed to match the variety of media that's being created is so, so vast. And so, uh, like I was saying, I love how accessible it makes sync, you know, that, that fact that it, it really does, there is a demand for every type of music. So if, unless you happen to make some super, super obscure niche type of music, uh, where you may find opportunities fewer for you, um, the likelihood is really in your favor that you're going to be able to find opportunities for whatever kind of music you make. Yeah. Is there a way that this has changed over time? I mean, you've been doing this now for how long? Like 10 years? Like yeah, give or take. That? I yeah? would say okay. the the I would say the only thing I've noticed is that the opportunities have increased dramatically. I mean, I don't I don't know about you. I do I like to watch TV and I generally watch streaming services, mm -hmm. use streaming services and it's like every day there's a new show. I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> and those shows use hundreds of if not thousands of songs, you know, mm -hmm. um, just per episode, you, you know, an episode can run a hundred songs per episode, you know? So, um, it, there's just the opportunities are just exploding. And I, especially I think post COVID when all people had to do was watch TV, you know, the production companies doubled down during that time. And that's when we saw Peacock and, you know, um, all these uh -huh. streaming services that didn't exist before the, it was like a light bulb went off, you know, with the big networks and they were like, OK, well, we've got to obviously invest in streaming, you know, and 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 making streaming content. So uh, if anything, I've just seen it grown. Yeah, I was going to ask you what COVID did for all of this, because the pandemic changed things for a lot of people. Yeah. And certainly made remote work a lot more acceptable, yeah, I guess, absolutely. or a lot more expected. Yeah. So what did that do for for musicians, do you think? I mean, in, in some aspects, it kind of tanked a lot of things yeah. because they couldn't perform live anymore. But what what was the uptick of that? Like, was there a pro to that? <laughs> yeah. I, th I mean, I can only speak to my experience because I wasn't an active touring gigging musician at the time. So it didn't really affect me in that mm -hmm. way. And I'm sure if I was, you know, if I were, then I might have a different story. But um, for me, it was a huge opportunity. 
I I basically just got to sit down. At the time, I was serving tables to pay bills, and I I was at that point I was you know obviously a non essential worker, and I was collecting my my uh, you know my emergency unemployment check or whatever they called it, and it was great. I was being paid to make music, and I just made music probably twelve hours a day, and I just I finally huh? right yeah <laughs> I was like oh this is this is what I want right this is yeah this is for the life for me right so um you know for me it just allowed me to to make a ton of music get a ton of practice meet a ton of people because everyone was meeting online in communities and you know I forged such such great friendships and collaborative relationships and um just had a ton of fun most of all it was just so much fun um and so I think that was the experience it must have been the experience for a lot of other musicians as well um and I think just realizing that that life is possible with or without a pandemic ideally without um you know, I think it, it really opened up that vision for a lot of people, myself included, and just in terms of how they want their life to look and, and, and how how amazing it is to actually live a life where you get to make music, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, it was a cool experience. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's good to hear that that's a possible thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, the last few years, last several years before COVID, it was really hard, yeah. you know, especially with Spotify taking over everything streaming yeah, wise totally. a lot. Uh, you know, really hard for any musician to make any money unless they're gigging or touring or, yeah. you know, and then that all went away during COVID. Yep. So, yeah. So if someone wants to get into sync, what would be the first thing that you would advise them to do? So I would say um, find someone to listen to your current sort of, you know, five or six songs that you think best represent where you're at in all aspects, songwriting, production. Get someone who has experience in sync, obviously, or at least experience, you know, um, earning money from their music. Um, and have them give you some honest feedback about where you're at. Um, I think that that's the best starting point because it allows you to really understand what you're working with and make a plan with that information because if you know all right I'm 80 percent there that that means you know you only have to go 20 percent further right and 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 obviously figuring out what that 20 percent looks like is 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 a can be a challenge but um it's at least a it's a path forward right and because I think one of the biggest things that deters people from trying something new is the perception that there's a huge learning curve and that there's a lot of work you know, to get to the other side. And, you know, maybe that's true to an extent. But the great thing is, most of the time, in my experience, you're not starting from zero. You really do have a lot going for you. You just have to figure out what's working, lean into those things, and then outsource the rest, right? Instead of trying to wear every hat and do every little thing, which musicians tend to do because it's expensive to outsource everything. Mm -hmm. um, but the methods that I teach anyway, I, I teach people how to outsource uh, for no upfront cost and, and rely and leverage the back end um, in order to get those services. And it's just a matter of finding the right people with the same vision in order to make that possible. But um, not to get too into the weeds, but yeah, I would say find someone, myself or anyone else, who can give you that honest feedback about where you're at and help you make a plan and then just take the next step and keep taking the next step. Yeah. One of the things that AI might be really good for is taking on some of those things that you might outsource. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that might make things easier in oh, a yeah. sense. So, you know, strangely, it could become your best friend. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I use AI to help me mix and to help me master. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you can tell I don't have a treated room. You know, I'm not mastering in a professional studio by any means or sure. mixing in a pro professional environment. But, mm -hmm. you know, the tools available to me, I can run everything through these headphones and it's 90% there usually on the first try. So... 
Yeah. Yeah. Totally it's great. It's amazing what these tools can do now. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Yeah. yeah. So how can someone reach out to you if they want to learn more about this? Oh, they can just take coaching from you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I would love to chat with anyone who wants to get some help and they can they can reach me right at my website. It's just nismaosman.com and you can just go to the contact um, and, and that'll directly shoot me an email and we can start chatting. And for anyone who is listening and wants to get in touch with you, I'm just going to spell your name out. So it's N-I-S-M-A-H-O-S-M-A-N. And is it dot com? Yes, dot com. Okay, perfect. I just want to make sure they knew the H was there. Yes, <laughs> that is helpful. Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to end this on a kind of philosophical note, because I want to ask you why you think sound is important. Mm. And I know it's a really big question, but everyone has a different answer. And I'm always curious. So what do you think? I love this question, um, because I, I kind of ask myself, not the same question, but similar, you know, a similar train of thought in terms of mm -hmm. Is what I'm doing important? Does it matter? You know, should I go and cure cancer instead? You know, but I always hey, maybe you are with your music. <laughs> yeah, you never know. I mean, stress is know. a stress is a big part of cancer, right? So it, exactly. Um, so, but I, I always come back to, you know, I think when people think about their lives and they think about the most important and the most special and memorable moments of their lives. There's always a soundtrack, whether it be an actual song or, you know, um, something sound or music related. Um, I think music really does help us uh, form really meaningful memories and form really meaningful plans, really, too, you know, and because I think not just in terms of entertainment, but in terms of experience overall you know and whether it's going to the movies or going to a concert or you know planning a wedding and figuring out what kind of music you want you know it's it's all it all adds to the depth and the color of our lives and um and I think that people know that inherently and that's why the music and the audio and the film industry are are so huge and why there's such a huge demand because sound and music and audio it, it, it all matters it all adds to that to that depth of life that that I think everyone is really ultimately searching for and it's cool to be a part of that yeah I could not agree more <laughs> yeah and on that note, thank you so much for being here, Nisma. Thank you for I having am me. So impressed with everything that you've accomplished, and I wish you every success going forward. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Jody. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time. <laughs>